Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prague Seat. It's Tuesday night. We've got almost the entire gang here together today uh, for a very interesting assignment that we gave ourselves. Uh, and, you know, an assignment that I think when you really think about it, we're doing our favorite 10 Prague fusion prog metal albums of all time. So kind of like our top 10 Desert Island discs, discs for the genres that we cover. But what's, it, what's really interesting about this is I've done on the channel over the last bunch of years, I've done various like my favorite albums of all time, my favorite songs of all time, all this kind of stuff. And it's interesting how every six months, every eight months, every year, year and a half, two years, you know, you, you think back on what are some of your favorites and they often change. Like you'll have, you'll have some that'll always show up on the list, but then others kind of creep in and creep out. So like myself personally, when I was putting together my list here and originally it was going to be our top five and everybody's basically like, there's no way I could just do five. So we're doing 10, two episodes. We're going to do six through 10 tonight, one through five next week. And by popular request from so many of our viewers, they're like, Pete, for once, can you please go first? So I'm going to go first tonight. <laughs> Take Here's, it your Here's your curveball. I'm not, and this is weird for me because I'm not used to this. Um, so I'm going to kick us off with my number 10. So I'm going to go with an album from a fair, this is the really the real, most recent one on my list. And this was from uh, what, 1999 or thereabouts. Uh, Dream Theater, Metropolis 2, Scenes from a Memory. Wanted to get some prog metal on here. Had to get some Dream Theater on here because Dream Theater has probably been my favorite band of the last 30 years or so. And this is by far my favorite album from them. The great concept album, musically jaw dropping. Songs are still catchy, but it's one of my favorite concept albums of all time. And it's heavy. And like I said, it's just jaw dropping virtuosity everywhere you look. So that's gonna be my number 10, Dream Theater. Metropolis 2 scenes from a memory and we're going to work our way up here so we're going to go Chuck we're going to go Chad John I didn't even introduce everybody hold on a second so we got in the house Chuck Alvarez greetings Bad. see see I threw myself <laughs> off. I'm going first I threw everything off tonight I'm never doing this again we've got Chad Hutchinson we've got John Newdorf hello everyone Stephen Reed Lewis Nasser. George Lemay, the two Chicago guys are always right next to each other on my Zoom. Always. We got up from another Canada. We got a bunch of Can Canadians here tonight. Actually, two of them. We got uh, Rick Labonte from the great state of New Jersey, the professor of Prague, Ken Golden. And last but not least, one of three New Yorkers on the call today, Mr. Eric Porter. Now we can get started. All right. So we're going to go Chuck, Chad. John, Stephen, Lewis, George, my God, we have a lot of people here, Rick, Ken, and Eric, and then myself, and we'll go round and round. So Chuck, your number, All now right, that I already right. kicked this off, your number 10. <laughs> right, number, once again, greetings, guys. I was a little distracted beforehand, but anyway, I want to make this real quick. Um, my favorite, um, actually, my number 10 is something that George is going to be kind of um, baffled by. It's uh, Miles Davis's um, The Complete in the Silent Way which has um, what's a, is, which is basically In a Silent Way and the album before, which is Feliz de Aquila and Manjaro, phenomenal album. All the stuff that wasn't on either or all of the albums that just made it onto here made the whole entire sessions much better. In a Silent Way, the complete um, sessions is my number 10. Great pick. I love that album. I know George doesn't, but I love it. <laughs> That's all right, George. We forgive you. <laughs> all right, Chad. What do you got for your number 10? Okay, well, um, like you, mine's a little more recent, not, not quite in the, the classic realm. Um, I'm gonna start off in Scandinavia and I'm gonna go with big Mellotrons, got some flute, uh, time changes everywhere. We're going with Anglegard's Hybris. My favorite song by them is, is Your Rock. If I'm on a desert island, I can't live without it. It's 11 minutes and 11 seconds of just time changes and Mellotron and craziness uh, and the whole album's solid. It's, it's dynamic from start to end. There's all kinds of great changes and wacky percussion, a little bit of Swedish vocals, but uh, yeah, solid album, top to, top to bottom. So Hybris is my number 10. Great pick, really good pick. John. All right, uh, my number 10 is King Crimson uh, in the Court of the Crimson King. Uh, I mean, I love this album. 
it's i mean besides the fact that it you know might be the the first progressive rock album i mean that's debatable but uh i mean everything about this is complex it's melodic i mean you have uh, lots of frenetic stuff going on um you know 21st century schizoid man is a classic you know so intense and then you know they, they then they um go with epitaph which is one of the most beautiful uh, crimson songs it's absolutely gorgeous and that's kind of the dichotomy of the band they can do something really pretty and then do something really kind of mind-blowing so uh moon child i really like moon child except it gets a little bit long in the imp improv bit but uh, but they end it, the end ending song, um, title track, um, is a great song. Probably my favorite on the album. Um, absolutely majestic. Uh, there's really not much else to be said. This great musicianship all around, flute, guitar, everything is, you know, it's grandiose, symphonic, complex. It's a great, great, great song. Hey, does George have anything to add to that? <laughs> <laughs> Two in a row. <laughs> <laughs> George is thinking he stole my pick. Wait, I think George left. Oh no, he stole oh, really? <laughs> Great pick, John. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be surprised if that didn't show up a few times uh, on these lists here today. So cool. Mr. Reed, all the way from Scotland. I just wanted to start by saying with, with you going first, Peter, you kind of reminded me of the, I don't know if it's a real story or not, but the story of Steven Tyler when he was completely not with it. What a, what a surprise. Uh, and they, the, the Aerosmith decided to throw a curveball and open with Walk This Way. And he walked out, did the song, and went, Thanks, good night, and walked <laughs> off. So that's the same sort of thing tonight. So <laughs> yep, yep, I totally hear you. Anyway, so back to my number 10. Well, it, 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 the standard sigh that I give with these impossible tasks, my shortlist was very long. I mean, very long. So I needed something else to get a, a grip on this. I grasped onto the desert island disc idea that was kind of thrown out when we, we first spoke about this. So I've actually tried to choose 10 albums that kind of give me something different. So if I'm going to end up with just 10 albums to listen to forevermore, I don't want them all to be from the same year and sound roughly the same. So are these all my favorite 10 of all time? They are for today. Let's just go with that then. Okay, so I needed some Marius Duda on this list somewhere because his music has been a huge part of my listening in the last, however long it's been, 20, 25, 30 years and around there somewhere, quite a long time now in actual fact. Uh, and this is one of the curveballs I'm going to throw because you see his name, everyone would think Riverside, so would I, so I've gone for Lunatic, Lunatic Soul, Soul. Uh, and I've gone for the most recent one. I've gone for two Shaded Woods from 2020. I think this is their best album. I think it's one of his best albums. I just love how calm this album is, how it combines his signature sound with the, the kind of folk elements that he wanted to bring in from Scandinavia and kind of the Slavic roots. And I just think it's a, a magnificent album that keeps revisiting themes, really takes you to a place and I absolutely love it. So that's definitely going to be my most recent pick, just from you know a couple of years ago, and that's my number ten lunatic song. Brave pick, very cool, very cool. All right, Lewis. All right, so a little bit like Stephen, I you know we, I I don't feel like any of us are really qualified to say what are the the best prog albums, and and even our favorite is is very subjective. So I I, I just gave myself some rules. They have to be albums where I don't skip any songs and also where I continue to learn and enjoy them differently with the years. They haven't, I'm not burnt out on any of them. That, that's, that's an important thing, right? So for me, this, this record was really kind of life-changing in many ways. My number 10, although again, the order, I don't know, right? But uh, Sleepy Time Girl, let me see them. Grand opening and closing. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. this man I, I i honestly don't know any musician in the baltimore area who didn't leave the 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 show that they played at orion without a, a massive crush on on carla the violin player and singer and it's not just it's not even a physical thing it's just like she's just so it's such an amazing musician 
and human being, right? So, yep. yeah, sleepy time. This is not for everybody, but when they did, when they played Nearfest, I, it was awesome it, just to watch expression. For, for as, for yeah, and as for as whack as their music is, they were such nice people. They oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They made, they made sure all the people your, uh... were wide awake their first thing in the morning, man. I tell yeah, you. Yeah, that's It was true. beautiful. I, and I they saw did them in hotel rooms. They slept in their bus. I saw them play at a festival in the Netherlands that uh, we had zero hour playing at Redemption. And I went over for the festival and Morgable played. And I warned all the bands. I said, you have to watch Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum. And after their set, they all came over to me and thanked me. They're like, because they had no idea who the band was. Yeah. Plus, plus they also built a lot of their own instruments. Yeah. yeah. So they, 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 I mean, these guys are the, are the whole package, theater, drama, composition, you know. It's 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 incredible. Very cool. All right, George. All right, my number ten. Uh, I owe a debt of gratitude to one of our fellow panelists, Mr. Golden, oh. about Spiral Architect, the Skeptics Universe. Totally maxed out version of uh, what they're trying to do here. All apologies to Cynic and Atheist and all those bands trying to be tech metal. This is as prog as it gets for the metal genre of great production. And they finally got it right on the vocal front. They put a guy out there that not only doesn't suck, he actually adds to it a lot. He's a big part of this, uh, yeah. what, what makes this so good. Um, the rhythm section play here, if, if you play a rhythm section instrument and you're not into this, I, I don't know what to say. It's, it's incredible. So and I also owe debt to a mutual friend of Ken and I, Neil Kernan, the production job on this is just kind of amazing. If it wasn't, George, if it wasn't for Neil, that album wouldn't have happened. I believe you. To me, this is his best work to me. So I go with Spiral Architect at number 10. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. That's a gem in my collection. Yep. Mm -hmm. In the number 10 slot, our absent friend, Mr. Ferraro, has Khan Space Shanty. Great album. Nice. Does everybody, does anybody else have a running list? I'm going to check off which ones I got right. There should be a like a Cupid doll prize or who gets the most. <laughs> you got to have some hilly, right? So we got one of them, right? Jobson. Yep, exactly. I don't give them away. Rick, <laughs> what do you got, Rick? Well, uh, this was tough, guys. I mean, I know I'm going to leave out some awesome bands out of the 10 that we know. And I know if I'm having trouble, my prog brothers here on the panel is having trouble like I am. So I just had to do the exact same mentality. Um, try to pick, you know, uh, 10 that would go on a desert island that you know you can't live without. And even that was tough. Then I thought of Paul Peter, you know, pick two on every line if I could. It is, after all, the second month, right? On the 22nd, right? Today of 2022. That's right. Um, anyway, but I'm not. Romanatic. I'm holding my hand number 10, trying to flip-flop what I'm going to use because if you know what I'm holding, you, we would have the same uh, challenge. But I'm going to go with... I'm going to go with Thicket the Brick, uh, Jethro Tall, number 10. It was over. could have been Camera Mirage, but this is the history that stands in itself. But anyway, that was tough. Trying to figure out what you're going to pick for 10 that represent all the best of every decade you know and so i think i did that but like this album and the one uh it had the wow factors that when you listen to it in it entirely you can't believe that wow that was like a like a movie or something you just watch like just such an epic that you just sit back and kind of look back and say wow that was incredible so that's why i'm able to pick is try to give you guys the best of that but this is tough go to show you to our audience out there there's so many great prog albums out there. What we're going to do is just a stretch of the surface because this was tough. So many bands could have four or five albums up there. Yeah, true. True. <laughs> anyway, anyway got to start somewhere. That's right. That's a great place to start. All right. Mr. Golden. Well, I, I've always said that I have 100 albums in my top 10. So it's, it's, you know, it's, well, but it's true, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's based on your mood and, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of factors. And, you know, if you ask me next month, I'll, I'm going to come up with 10 different ones. 
So uh, my list is probably going to be a little different than everybody else's. But already, hey, Chuck, Chuck so and Miles Davis. So, you know, that's great. I mean, that's awesome. So it's, it, that's an inspired pick. So space is the place. My my number 10 pick Dun is Ashra Temple, the first Ashra Temple album. Oh, I love that album. Yeah, it's uh, this is a classic. Uh, I, I stumbled on this album. I was about I was about 17 years old. I used to go to a shop called the Music Box in Queens. I used to get off the bus when I was coming home from high school. And, and I used to go play pinball and go through the used albums. And there it was with this incredible fold-out cover for buck 75. Now it's <laughs> a lot more than that, and uh, as you can imagine. And it's been in my collection ever since. Uh, the first time I played it, I accidentally, I accidentally played it at 45 RPM. I never oh. heard a guitarist play so fast in my life. It was, it was jaw dropping. So it's, it's just two sidelong tracks. The band at the time was uh, Manuel Gotching on guitar, mm -hmm. Hartman Enk was the bass player, and Klaus Schultz was on drums and synthesizers. He had, he had left Tangerine Dream at that point. So it's just two side long tracks. The first side, it's like a total guitar wank fest. So it's a very spacey and it just sort of drifts. But then the tension kind of, it just kind of builds. After about five minutes, it catches fire. And, and Manuel Gotchin just totally goes off his nut for the rest of the, that side. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. The second side, it's a little, a little more sedate, a uh, little more emphasis on spacey synthesizer sounds but it's real early synthesizer stuff so mm -hmm. uh but it, and it just picks up at the end and gotching is just killing at the end uh it's just an album that just resonates with me and it's been with me my entire life really and uh yeah it, it these albums that we're talking about like for me the albums i'm talking about for a lot of, i have a very emotional connection to these albums when we're talking about the top 10 you know these these are albums that they're in my DNA. They're not, you know, it's, you know, if, if, if I never heard this album again, it would be a tragic loss for me. There you go. That's a yeah, great way to put it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Cool. That's what I got so far. Eric, number 10. Well, I think all of you have mentioned this when you started talking where, you know, your list might change in a month. And Pete, you started it out with that, you know, next year, your top 10 may be different. And as George thanked Ken, I have to thank George because I've been <clears throat> getting into a lot of fusion because of George. And I went back to the first fusion album I ever bought when I was getting into Prague and trying to read about Prague bands and stuff. And this band always kept coming up. My number 10 is going to be Return to Forever, Romantic Warrior. <laughs> and I've been using this kind of as a benchmark um, with stuff that George has given me. And I've gone back and listened to this a lot over the last year. And this might not have been in my top 10 a year ago, um, but it is now. So um, thanks, George. But that's my number 10. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I'm going to dip into the fusion bag for my number nine. Intermanic Flame by the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Savage Air album. Splitting. Beautiful album. Yeah, absolutely, Chuck. I mean, this has everything. It's just so groundbreaking, so different. What One of the greatest bands of all time. I mean, this lineup on this album and the next album. Uh, just absolutely amazing. John McLaughlin, Jan Hammer, Rick Laird, Jerry Goodman, and Mr. Billy Cobham. Doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, it's, it's ferocious at times. It's absolutely gorgeous at others. Just amazing. And, you know, Call it jazz rock, but man, this is like there's funk on here. There's definitely this is Prague as far as I'm concerned as well. Uh, this is just McLaughlin and the guy's just going and doing something completely different, taking what he learned from Miles and just taking it to another planet. So yeah, that's my number nine, Intermanic Flame from the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Back to Chuck. All right, my number nine will, is an album I talk about and featured here many other times and so. It, no, just like what Lewis said, if you have an album that you don't skip anything and you just continue to love it and learn from it, um, <laughs> um, what's ah. it? <laughs> That's awesome. Have, hey. Hi. Uh, Grandson. Hello. Hey, hey, man. That's Michael. Hi, Michael. Hey, Michael. Hi, Michael. How you doing? Good. Uh, 
<laughs> my yeah. number nine, my number nine is uh, um, Roxy Music, uh, For Your Pleasure. Um, it's an album which, uh, that I find um, is perhaps their finest hour of all the albums that they've done. Um, pretty much more um, in the prog mode than it is any other album that they did afterwards and definitely a bit more, more progish than their first album. Um, my number nine, once again, is Roxy Music's For Your Pleasure. Nice. Nice pick. Very cool. All right. Where are we? Chad. Okay. So um, I'm nothing if not consistent. So based on what we did uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, my number nine is going to be King Crimson's Red. It was my favorite lineup. It's my favorite album by them. Um, there's lots of angst in it. Um, red is just unrelenting and heavy and biting. You get some of that one more red nightmare and you get the crashing cymbals. You've just got the sublime bass and vocals of Wetton and, and Starless. And yes, Anthony, Providence is a song. It's called a jam. Mm -hmm. um, Love it. Even the uh, Ian McDonald, the late Ian McDonald, God rest his soul, uh, came back and played on this. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's a killer from, from start to finish. Um, it's the most aggressive out of the out of the their repertoire, uh, especially the early days. Uh, I could have easily picked Lark's Tongues. I was right behind it, but uh, my representation from the Crimson Fold is red from 1974. Very cool. And before I forget, I should have done this at the top of the show. Uh, raise a glass to Gary Brooker, who left us. Oh my God! Yes, recently, you know, most definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know how much I love Procol Harum. So. Yeah, big loss. What a voice. Uh, yeah. All right, John, back to you. Okay, uh, my number nine is uh, Thick as a Brick uh, from Jeff Lopel, uh 1972 release. Uh, I think it's their fifth album. And it wasn't the album that I, I got into tall with, believe it or not. It was Crest from a Knave when I, or Crest of a Knave, I think. Um, so I wasn't into tall back in the, Kind of to late 70s but uh it was more of a discovery in the 80s after after crest of a knave which i actually think is underrated um i started listening to jeff Apollo a lot more and this album i mean there wasn't really yeah i mean you know one song right i mean if you have the cd it's really one song if you have the vinyl i mean it's broken up into two parts but uh i mean it's so complex uh and it's so melodic like um, and the way Anderson holds the notes when he's singing um, just emphasizes the lyrics, which are really good as well. Uh, so you have all this complexity. Um, you have you know, all these different moods and themes on the album. And you have this, you know, heavy and light. And you have, um, you know, fantastic flute, of course. Um, guitar playing is awesome. The drumming is complex. The rhythms are complex and then you know you, you have this I think one of their best melodies they've ever uh, put to tape so and they make it into this co cohesive piece of just I mean you wouldn't think that it would be natural you know this this 44 minute song but it completely works for me so it's that's number nine just what Paul nice a work of art yeah never to be recreated work of art yeah yeah absolutely Steven. Well, an awful lot in recent weeks, we've been talking about bands who tried to balance a progressive side with a more melodic and more commercial side. And for me personally, the band that did it best, although they also toppled over the edge at one point, is Saga. Oh, so Worlds me, Apart. I've gone with Worlds Apart. This is, I brought out the CD and then thought, well, no, I really. I need to show the proper cover because that's neither cover are great, but at least this one's got something about it. <laughs> so we're in 1981, uh, and I just adore this album. Uh, I know that there's more progressive albums earlier on in the catalogue. The first three are definitely more progressive. There's a, a few missed beats that come later in the 80s, and then in more recent times, well, more recent times, last 20 years, they really kind of refound what they were about, I think. But for me, realistically, this is the album that I always go back to. It's the one from the catalogue that I really could not do without. It's got two of the chapters on it, No Regrets, uh, No Stranger, which are just outstandingly good. But the old-fashioned side one here, 
with on the loose, uh, wind them up and amnesia, which I think is one of Sadler's mm -hmm. best vocals. So much character to that, I just think is utterly outstanding. So my number nine is Worlds Apart by Saga. Underrated band, I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah, and you know what? It's almost cliche to say that it's their best album because and it's their biggest seller. But quite frankly and honestly, it's really they're probably only perfect album start to finish. They have other albums, which I may even say I enjoy more, but I think that Worlds Apart is just so strong. Yeah, Captain depending on the like mood, seven. I'll go to different eras of Saga. Yeah. But if you want me to choose the album that I like best, well, that's Worlds Apart. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. why it's on the list. Yeah, I hear you. Good choice. Great album. Lewis, back to you. All right. Um, well, for, for my next one, again, I the heart wants what the heart wants. And I I cannot express how much I love Universe Zero. 13, 13. Oh, Legacy. Great choice. This is a sublime masterpiece. And I, I, I truly, it, it changed my life completely. And I, I can't imagine not having it handy whenever I need to hit. When my head sounds like this, I play it and it soothes me. And this is a, a wonderful thing to have. People who've never heard this, you really should jump on it. I know they've now re since remastered it. It probably sounds a lot better. And no. then you go see our, our friend Steve Feigenbaum. He can hook you up. But this, you must have. A you dark, know, menacing master. Three songs. Well, but they, what songs? Yeah, yep. You're only going to have three songs. Make sure they're this fucking good. Yep. <laughs> those, those, those original mixes and masters sound fantastic. Oh yeah, but um, I, I don't, I don't, I never compared. I don't know what the remasters sound like. I, I haven't heard it. I, I, would, I wouldn't have screwed around with them at all. It, this is just so good, you know. So yeah, Heresy is great. Really, good. I don't think I don't think I blinked that during their entire set at Nearfest. No, amazing. no, that, and that was another incredible thing. I never thought I would get the chance to see them live, and then you fucking guys brought them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm there. You know, you're welcome. I remember yeah. after their set, everybody ran over to the vendor hall to like Ken and Steve's and uh, and Greg's uh, tables to buy whatever was available yeah. from the University. They're an amazing, they were an amazing band, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. Great pick. Great pick. Uh, excellent pick. Mm -hmm. All right, George, what do you got? Number nine is uh, Sean Lane, Powers of Ten. Oh. I, think I first came across on an old VHS and just it's most over the top uh, crazy guitar playing. And uh, then he finally puts out this de debut a couple of years later and it's the exact opposite. Very serene. Uh, it evokes like a dreaminess to it. There's, there's some challenging playing, but um, it's more about the melodies, very overt melodies on here. Really, really gets to you. I, I never go very long without hearing this. And it's, a varied palette there's two orchestral tracks there's a bebop tune there's a a, a boogie tune it's a lot of really good playing and he plays all four instruments not functionally good like yeah. he's a better drummer than i am i hate to say it. i mean he's really good but yeah sean lane powers of 10 yeah Thanks. phenomenal album phenomenal talent yeah mm -hmm. great pick cool. and Hi, rick david gilmore self-titled Oh, that's right for Anthony. David Gilmore said, oh, the first one. Okay, good. Very cool. Okay. Very cool. So, uh, number nine. Well, I'm going to go very similar to the first pick. Thick as a Brick with one song, right? And I never heard it like people have vinyl. I've only heard it as a CD for when I was you know, a young guy getting into tall. And so this album is the same thing, but it's in the 21st century, and it's one song for the entire thing, but it's broken down, and it's transatlantic. The whirlwind. Okay, so it's an epic piece, right from start to finish. Everything that you want to hear in Prague, but to separate the personalities. Everybody gets a little vocal piece. Everybody gets to express themselves in a way that is a whirlwind. By the time you finish it, you you it's like it's a, an incredible ride, incredible journey. And uh, I mean, I couldn't really go into an individual track because they're all good and they all have a little bit like. Like what we like about Tommy or Quadnifinia, they always have that little humming of music of 
throughout the whole album have that little piece of Tommy all the way through it. There's always that reprise that's always playing through the music. And they do that. Even if they modulate it to a different key, they play that similar passage that give you that hook and made it feel like one big one one big song. I don't, you know, uh, it's almost like when I listen to Thick as a Brick, I know now where they separated for vinyl one, a side A and side B. But as a long time, I wouldn't because I heard it as one piece. It was that solid. Same thing. This was done only for CD, so it was designed, but they maximized the time of the CD as much as they could. Anyway, so check it out if you haven't. It is a super group as we know it. Um, the Flower King, you got Spark Beard at the time, um, Marillion, oh, yeah. Dream Theater, all these superstars all inside one band. So they got a piece of that band history and whatever they create. And one thing they do have in common is they love all the heroes that we talk about probably in our top 10 and the Beatles and some. So they put that in there if they can. And they've been doing that pretty well. And they all like each other. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No figure, right? That, that doesn't yeah. happen. Right? Well, yeah, and, and they, don't spend, they don't spend that much time together. That helps. They really don't. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> they go, they get together, they write an album, they do a short tour, see you in five years, right? That's it. That's true. It doesn't mean they can agree with the album should sound like three versions of right. Anyway. Right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> True. It's almost like whatever they didn't use in the normal project, they kept it aside for this day might come when Mike is going to put us all together in a room and we're going to write some stuff. Yeah. So cool. All right, Ken, back to you. All right. So I'm going to give a little flex here. This is perhaps the rarest album still in my collection. Uh, a little obscure, but for me, it's an essential album. It's uh, Niho, Niho Jin from Far Out, the Japanese band. A lot of people might not be familiar with the band. They were a, a bit of a precursor to the Far East Family Band. Uh, if you guys are familiar with them, maybe not. Uh, Kataro, Kataro was in the Far East Family Band. Right. The common thread between the two bands was uh, a uh, synthesizer player, Fumio Miyashita. Uh, this is it's a, it's a psychedelic album, really. It's not, I, I wouldn't call it a prog album per se. Uh, it, for me, it's one of these albums, very intense album. You have to listen to this album with the lights out. That's the best way to experience this album. That's the way, by the way, that's the way I primarily listen to music. I listen, I listen in the dark. So I, for me, it's, it's just a much more enjoyable experience. And if you haven't tried it, you should try it. So uh, for me, this is, I mean, it, this is like a, a three tissue listen. I mean, you know, if you know what I mean. I mean, you don't want to listen to this album with your friends because then it, it just turns into like a total jizz fest. So, yeah. it's, yeah. so <laughs> I mean, it's very it's 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 very intense. So there's two side long pieces. You get too many people, which is the first side, and Niho Jim, which is the second side. Uh, too many pe uh, too many people. It's very spacey. It starts out with the sound of like wind rushing all around, and then you get some some vocals and like really kind of shitty broken English. But then the guitar player, this guy, uh, Aichi Sayu, who I, I don't know if he's ever done anything else. He, he plays this kind of bluesy, spacey guitar leads. It just kind of, just kind of builds and builds. He's got this sort of like Tony Iommi intensity to him. And then the, the bass player, Kai Ishikawa, he's playing electric sitar through the entire mm. side and, and actually on the entire album. And then it just kind of, you know, it comes it comes to this great climax. The side, side comes to this great climax. And at that point, I think I did also. So um, the second side kind of it's kind of a little different, but not much different. It starts out with gongs and percussion and it just kind of builds. There's this tension throughout the whole side. And then it just kind of releases the, gently and into this sort of like cosmic bliss at the end. It was later re-recorded for uh, the Forest Family Band's Nip Nippon Jin, which was remixed by Klaus Schultz. For, uh, it was basically a remix of the Cave Down to the Earth. So anyway, Niho Jin from Far Out, a bit obscure, but an album I've been listening to for decades and just a very, very special album. Uh, got reissued, uh, got an official reissue about a year and a half ago and should still be in print and you should track it down because it is a mind fuck. Sounds like it. 
You like guitar? You like sitar? You want to check this thing out? Cool. All right, Eric. My number nine, it's a band that I discovered in the mid 90s when I was in college and getting into Prague. This is one of the first bands that someone didn't hand something to me saying, listen to this. Um, I had started doing some reading and you'll see the name kind of pop up. Um, I had some book about progressive music back then, way back then, believe it or not. And obviously we're not too far removed from the seventies, but this is now my always listen to all the way through. I bring it out a lot. Um, and I need to hear this guy's guitar playing, but I think this album all the way through is just very sublime. It's beautiful. That's an Anthony word, by the way, sublime. And I'm sure he'll approve of this one. It's uh, the Snow Goose. Yes. Right mm -hmm. um, I bring this out quite a bit. And ever since I, I think I taped it from the radio stations collection and listened to it on cassette for years and bought the CD. Um, but it's something that I go back to and I play a lot of camel, but that's probably my favorite. It is my favorite of theirs. Um, all instrumental, it's a lot of flute. Uh, you get the guitar, you get some intensity, you get a lot of uh, mellower stuff, but just a great listen from start to finish. Peter Bardens is the man on that now. Oh, yeah. Good choice. All right, for my number, where are we at? Number eight. So I, I said at the top of the hour how sometimes like you put together lists of favorites for bands and things like that. And then, you know, you feel pretty strongly about your list and your picks. And then like, you know, some time goes by and maybe you switch the order around and you kind of think a little bit differently about a couple of the albums because you've been listening to them a lot. And I, this particular band, throughout my history with this band, I have constantly flip-flopped which is my favorite depending on the time right so like for the last like year i've been proclaiming another album from this band that i that kind of moved into my number one spot but again since i did that video and that ranking of this band i've, I've been listening to them a lot no surprise because i always have and the album that i proclaimed was my favorite for them for many years for decades has kind of come back into the forefront. And I think, you know, when it comes down to it, if I was going to go to a desert island with only 10 albums, one of them had to be Return to Forever. And the one that it would just have to be is Romantic Warrior. And, you know, Eric talked quite a bit about this before. And I think he said basically everything I would say. This is just, you know, they have some spectacular moments, moments on their other albums together, but the, the last one that the electric band, well, the electric group, I don't want to take any thunder away from Chick's great electric band from the 80s and 90s, but the last full electric album from Return to Forever is just absolutely magical. Every song is great. Every guy gets to shine and it's so perfectly recorded. It just sounds amazing. And uh, again, it's just as much a prog album as it is a jazz rock album to me. So it had to be on this list. So there you have it. My what, number, what was your what was Pete, what was your favorite? Where have I known you before has been my favorite for the last couple of years. Yeah. It flip flops all the time. I, I've there was a time where him and the Seventh Galaxy was my favorite. So it's the thing. The thing with Romantic Warriors, I think they acknowledge and yes acknowledge. I think that there was kind of a love affair between the two bands and mm -hmm. and you know every layer. Yeah, Relayer was heavily influenced by you know by Return to Forever, and I and I think Yes was uh, a strong influence on uh, on Return to Forever yeah. for Romantic Warrior. Yep, great album, great band. You know, I think between that that lineup of RTF and the original lineup of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, I've said it a million times. Those are two of the baddest bands on the planet ever, oh. ever. Mm -hmm. All right, Chuck, back to you. My number eight is Beyond Nothingness and Eternity, Mahavishnu Orchestra. Kick-ass fucking album. This album, man, was a, was, well, their studio stuff was amazing, but live, these three songs on this album just, just, you, you just couldn't, you could just feel the fury from this album. Uh, what's uh, um, Ken? Did you get to see them live? This um, this I, version? I never saw Mahavishnu. Oh, you never saw them? I never oh, did. Man. Yeah, mm. got to see Return to Forever, but not okay. Mahavishnu. So did I. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, man. What's up? an amazing album? Yeah, the live album, just amazing. Trilogy, Sister Andrea, and Dream. All 22 minutes of it. Amazing. Phenomenal album right here, man. Some blazing fury, heavy, heavy metalish type of jazz fusion right there. Mahavishnu Orchestra, my number eight. Mm -hmm. And Billy Cobham's best ever recorded drumming. In oh, my gosh. Album. Oh, amazing. Savage. Savage. Every, everybody who ever saw them said they were the loudest band they ever saw. Uh, I had two co-workers um, that were actually, were actually at their first ever show downtown Manhattan. And one of them, he said that him and his um, then girlfriend um, both left there were from tinnitus. You know, it was so loud. You know, people didn't know what to think of them. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Crazy. Would have loved to have seen him. Oh, man. All, All right, right, Chad, number... back to you. Okay, well, I'm going to stay within the same year that I, my number nine. We're going to stay in 1974. We're also going to stay with one of the one of the bigger bands. I'm I'm not as cool to be super obscure like Ken, but who can be? Um, It'll never happen for you, man. It, it won't. I've been trying for years. Look, yeah. look, I'm looking for the same haircut. Yeah, well, I'll give you I'll give you some pointers after the show. Okay, yeah. you can keep the sitar though. Um, so I'm going to go with Gentle Giants, Power and the Glory. I think this is the album. I, now, a lot of their albums are solid. I could have picked Octopus. I could have picked In the Glass House. Both of them were a little more aggressive than this one. But I think this is where everything comes together. It's like a little, maybe a tiny bit more mature. Um, it's still got all the great interplay. Uh, Proclamation happens to be my favorite song by them. Somehow, a lot of that is in 4-4. If you ask Gary Green, it's all in one, which I think is funny. Um, <laughs> Uh, Cogs and Cogs is a complete masterpiece. I mean, that just keeps you on your toes the entire time. You've got a good sub, uh, sublime songs. I have to use that for Anthony too. Uh, like like um, Carrie Gineer, uh, Ke yeah, Carrie Meneer's uh, aspirations with the electric piano, just beautiful. But uh, top to bottom, fantastic album. Um, and again, Pete, like you said, this could bounce between a few albums anytime. But Power and the Glory is my number eight. Yeah, Gentle Giant for me is another one of those bands where I'm constantly changing my favorite album all the time. Well, and it have been forever. It's, yeah. it's whatever's in your hand at that time. Yeah, I mean, it's like, oh, you know, I, li I listened to In a Glass House at the Gym last week. Yeah, that's my new favorite. And then you listen to Three Friends, <laughs> Two Weeks now. That's my favorite now. It's like, ah, they're all great. Acquiring the taste. Yeah, exactly. All they're all great. They're all great when you listen to them. That's my number one. Tomorrow. The interesting change. thing about Power and the Glory with the reissue is they have the, the title track on there as a bonus. Yeah. And it's not quite as strong as the rest of the album. I think that's why um, they left it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but you can kind of see it started to lean to where they were going to end up after Freehand. It has a little more of that simplistic feel to it. It's still a good song, don't get me wrong. But um, you, you could see a little bit of a, a more straightforward leaning there. Yep. Great album, though. I agree. Oh, yeah. All right, John, back to you. Okay, uh, number eight uh, is I'm going to go with Rush Hemispheres from 1978, their sixth album. Uh, again, I wasn't this wasn't the album that that uh, got me into Rush. That was Moving Pictures, but uh, you know this is just a fantastic album, and I think it's where they really start to get progressive in this album. Uh, you know, the the first song Hemispheres kind of brings back well Cygnus from here all the kings but it's this this suite that you know constantly changing and the transitions are smooth like or you know like they don't they're not jarring even though they're doing some crazy things rhythmically uh, i think they really um were honing their craft on on hemispheres uh this is a great opening track and I mean, you know some people you know the vocals of i think getty sounds great on this album uh, but it's it's kind of an acquired taste, of course. Um, I, I love his singing in general, uh, but um, you know it, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, but I think it's a great great song. Uh, and then they kind of go with a couple of shorter tracks. Um, Circumstances is really catchy, a uh, good rocker. And then the trees, which is probably you know they had a lot of quite quite a quite, a, quite successful with this one. Uh, you know, and who would write a song about oaks and, and maples and, you know, competing for light in the forest. I mean, it's, 
it's, it's interesting because I, I was reading an article or an interview with Getty Lee and he, he kind of referenced John Anderson. You know, he, you know he's, he's a big, they're big Yes fans. And, you know, and who really knows what, what the hell Yes is singing about? And he kind of likes that, that mystery. It's all, you know, we got to kind of, you know, it's up to us to decide type thing. But anyway, it's an addictive song and it's a great song. Uh, and then the last song, uh, La Vila Strangiato is kind of, you know, um, I guess it was kind of loosely based on um, uh, life since dreams that he was having at the time. Uh, and it's just a wicked prog rock instrumental. I, one of the best songs that, you know, Rush ever did. Uh, just, just absolute, absolute craziness. And life since acoustic guitar at the beginning kind of starts out gentle. And then he, he just brings on this amazing uh, flourish on the acoustic guitar and it just it goes to show what an amazing uh, musician he what he is and they all they all were at the time for sure anyway uh, one of the best rush albums uh, for sure and my number eight Excellent great choice, great choice. I think we, we might see that also from a couple of the people I'm, I'm thinking before we're all said and done here over the next two weeks so uh, Stephen what do you got well, for my number eight, I'm going back to 1975, so right into the heart of classic prog. Um, so we're all thinking, hmm, which you know, which of the, the main players is he going to pick out? Well, he's going to pick out Angel. Is where he's going to go. So not a classic prog band at all. Uh, the latter day stuff, which is all rock and prog, possibly even into pop basically erases what happens on this album because this is a fantastic progressive rock album. It's heavy, yes. it's aggressive, and it's just fantastic. The tower that opens it up is just a phenomenal piece of music. Why Greg Geoffrey decided never to play like this after this album ever again, I have no idea. I wish he had done. But the way that him and Punky Meadows combine on this album is just outstandingly good. Add in the, the vocals of Frank Domino, who is always sung up here, always, <laughs> all, uh, 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 all the time. Oh man, is that effective, and it's just so good. And then you close the album out with the angel theme. I mean, it's just a synth wankathon, realistically, do you know? And then they go and do a different version of the same piece on Hell of a Band to close it out as well. So I just think this is a fantastic album. I think it's hugely underrated. I think the angel, all the white suits and all the nonsense that would follow, which I quite like, completely blanks out what happens at this stage of the band and everyone just completely dismisses them as bubblegum nonsense. Well, they're not here. This is excellent and I really like it and I just couldn't do without it. Play it often and I play it loud. So Angel's debut, self-titled from 1975. Nice. Great choice, great album. Yeah. Butch Jones is watching. He is celebrating and giving you a high five from the thing called the internet right now. Do, do I get any points for having seen Geoffrey? Oh, no. you do from me anyway. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 I saw them. Like this stuff. I saw them open up for Bad Company in Madison Square Garden. Wow, that's wow. a strange one. Their first cool. album, right? Because I know they did some big tours there. I so. think so. I don't. I can't tell you anything about them. I, other than they had, they all had very long hair. What was this your big hit? I remember Jeffrey. Call to the oh, Heart. Call to the Heart. that came off the debut. Silk and Steel was album number two. I'm a Geoffrey a fan. I like the whole thing. I like House of Lords. I wish the guy was still playing. There you go. Yeah, I, I like him. Yeah, good choice. Good choice. All right, Lewis, what do you got? All right. So for my number eight, it's an album that when it came out, it was also completely life transforming and i think i i i was already quite old when it came out but but it i just listened to it non-stop for years i as you can see from the back i went to catch him on that tour with none other than dixie dregs and of course i'm talking about dream theater scenes from a memory to me this is the band at their peak yep agree and you know unfortunately for me once they did the astonishing and they, they, they conveyed very clearly that they don't take themselves seriously. There's no fucking reason for me to take them seriously either. But back then I was, I was all in, I was all in. And this album is indispensable for me. I love every second of it. 
even though it is long, it doesn't feel long. It's it feels just right. So scenes. I would almost agree with that about the astounding or the astonishing. It's it's garbage. But the album after it, Distance Over Time, I thought was quite strong. I enjoyed that. I, 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 I've heard that. Me too. I'm, oh, just, I I'm still pissed off. That's all. Oh, I'm I agree. Like, <laughs> I, I got you know, Lewis. I, I like you. I was really pissed off after the Astonishing. It's the only album by them I don't like. But they're 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 two that came out after it are both really really good. So I forgive. They it. just played Chicago on Sunday, and um, everybody said I'm an idiot for not going, and I probably am, but I'm still yeah, mad. I'm going to New Jersey in a couple of weeks. So yeah, yeah. To where, they, where are they playing in Jersey? Uh, I think at the it Count Basie. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, I, yeah that's, I, think, I think that's where they're playing because I think it's the same place I saw them like three years ago, but I, I, I could be mistaken. I don't know. My brother, my brother lives down in that neck of the woods, so he's he picked up a ticket. So, all right, George, back to you. Number eight, 1996 Symphony X. Nice, by Tragedy. Yep. Uh, like Spiral Architect, it's the a maxed out version of what they're trying to do. Uh, main man, Michael Romeo, he's a big fan of uh, modern era classical composers. He's a big fan of the old Kansas kind of stuff. So he tries to put the classical with the odd meter. He's also a big priest fan. So there's metal represented here. I mean, it, it, he puts it together about as well as you can do it. And it works even better because the individuals involved, you got Russell Allen is like Dio meets Walsh. Mm -hmm. Romeo himself, uh, an adventurous lead player, great writer. Uh, the old bass player, Thomas Miller, is another reason why I like older Symphony X better, because that guy's six-string player, more interesting than the guy they have now. Just uh, a really, really good album. Even uh, there's a 20-minute epic, of course, for their prog cred. And then uh, even the softy on here, real nice ballad. It's the last song in the album, but it, it needn't be, because it's uh, actually a really good tune. Just, Perfect for what it is. Yep. The album that got me into Symphony X. Yep. They've Same just here. gotten better with age, man. They know there has not been, other than their debut album, every album is killer, in my opinion. Everyone. That one's them. still my favorite. Yeah, mine, mine too. Mm -hmm. still my favorite. Cool. Uh, Mr. Ferraro has Yes, Relayer. All right. Cool. All right, Rick. Okay, um, did a game changer for me. This is when uh, the few uh, bands of the 80s that made me feel that like prog wasn't dead and uh, it wasn't a thing of the past. And also for a singer, helped me learn to write lyrics, not always uh, as in the first person, but as a narrator or even to act out the, the lyric when you're performing it. And I'm talking about Marillion, a script for Justice 2. That was a big game changer for me. Not only musically beautiful, right? All the, the it, it feels like you're in a theater and he's acting out a scene. And lo and behold, before I even seen video, right? I end up seeing it and he actually does all that kind of stuff. He lived up to the expectation because when I'm just going like, you know, like uh, Ken was saying, shut off the light when you listen to music. That's where, why he's saying that because you're going to the audio, the video of your mind and it takes you into a place where your imagination could take you. And him, his character uh, in every song is so captivating. I can't help be, uh, you know, um, just want to know what, what the hell he had to say and what, what he's got to say about it. And the music back it up. The music is sort of enhanced whatever the mood or drama they're creating. So I like that because Roger Waters does it well. Uh, he does it phenomenal, a fish. And I became a big fan of that. So I was like, unfortunately, I discovered this album and it's the first one uh, of this band just when he was on his way out. I was a late boomer. I got into it in the late 80s, and he was on oh, his yeah. way out. And it broke my heart to hear about that. It's the one tour I didn't go see Rush with them opening up. And had I did that, I would have saw him uh, perform with that band. But anyway, I really like, I mean, there's only, what, six songs in this whole thing. And it's, it's amazing. Monday. Yeah, and it's so perfectly not running order, you can't skip it. You feel like you missed something because it's so cohesive. It all feels that all part of it. And I just love the way he describes things with his lyrics and and changing when he goes around to that thing, 
spot. He does something a little different. So you got to pay attention. And to me, I, I thought that was intelligent. That's what I thought. So it's more of like an intelligent music as well. The, the band is great. And I love the way they sounded considering the 80s had all that, you know, you know, the gated verb and all that stuff going on. They sounded good. They sounded great for the time. And so that's one of the uh, my picks. It had to because it was a, a wow factor for me. I walked away saying, wow, I got to see what these guys like live. And then when you see them perform these things, uh, any one of these tracks, it's like, wow. It's all, it's all what you expected, you know? Love that I album. Know. Only one drawback to that album. And for those who are fans of the drummer. <laughs> exactly. Nick oh, PT Pointer. Oh, he was terrible. Well, he oh, didn't gosh. he didn't play with a click track, right? So oh. it was a little No, no, he, he I think he did his best. That's the problem. Yep. <laughs> okay. It, Sorry. It, it, it was bad, man. Yeah. Well, with, with, with Arena, he's become much better. You know, but oh, he's great with Arena. Yeah. There. Yeah. With Arena oh, yeah. but, but then like, oh, that album, it, 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 it actually saddens you, you know, that you would rather prefer to listen to live tracks. But remember, for a long time, they never played, um, what's it? They never played, um, what's it? Um, the, the last song on side three, um, um, The Web. They hadn't, yeah. played, they, had, they hadn't played The Web for many years after, after that show. And it took them like almost 30 years to play that song all over again. So you, you would never know how all six songs had sounded uh, with um, a better drummer on it. Um, one of my also favorite songs from that is also, um, what's it, um, the single, Marcus Square Heroes. Yeah. 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 Every song I actually, for, uh, for many years, I've always said my favorite Fish Era album was Clutching at Straws. But I got to tell you, since I bought the the box set of uh, Script for a Jester's Tear, I have like an absolute renewed love interest with that debut album. And man, those songs are so good. And, see, and watching, you know, the recital of the script performance on the Blu-ray or DVD, mm. whatever it is, mm. I've watched that over and over and over again. Forgotten Sons. Oh, my God. Mm. So good. Tell it's like a life-changing experience. Tell song. Oh, I, I got it. I, 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 I'm, I'm just in so amazed with all the shows that they put out and uh and all the uh, content that's available because uh they were heavy bootleg for a band for that short span uh, there's a lot of stuff out there i had to get it all yeah yeah Great. i've got stuff from even before they were signed bootlegs from the marquee shows and various things all these embryonic versions of these songs that would go on to that album for all the stuff even at that stage yeah, I, I started i started with them with grendel grendel's great oh, wow. because at the Grendel. time Melody Maker, <laughs> Melody Maker was trying to create, you know, we had the new wave of British heavy metal. So they were starting to, they were trying to start a new wave of British progressive rock. And Marillion was like the forefront of that. And I remember when the Grendel, when Grendel came out, I mentioned earlier on the music box the story I used to go to, they got in the Grendel uh, single, the, what was the sidelong piece, whatever. Man, I, I lost my shit. That was, I mean, I mean, you know, because there was nothing going on in what was it, 1981, 1982. I mean, Prague was basically dead. And here, here's these guys come along and they're doing this thing that kind of sounded like Genesis in a way. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, man, it was like they were doing they were doing Genesis and ge that Genesis had stopped doing. Yeah, basically, right. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's like Wobbler with Yes. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. sure. Kind of. Oh, what sure. a great band, man. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice one, Lewis. Nice yeah. one. Yep. All right, Ken. All right, I'm going to go a little more conventional with number eight. So I, I, I know I was a little out on my uh, my first two picks, a little, a little obscure. This is maybe a, shame. a little, little <laughs> bit more down there. But, you know. uh, Eloy, Silent Cries and Mighty Echoes. So maybe not, maybe not uh, the best Eloy album. That might be Ocean. Yeah, but mm -hmm. maybe. But the thing is, and the reason I didn't pick Ocean is because I think the live album, all the material from Ocean is performed better. And this album, this is great. I mean, at any given moment, I, I could I could change to, let's say, you know, Ocean or something else. But to me, it's like it's, you know, is this undeniable Pink Floyd influence. But somehow Frank Borneman, he kind of carved out a, an Eloy sound, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, 
there's always been kind of a change in the lineup and it's always changed the the sound a bit but it's but frank is like he's the glue and uh at the time detlef schmitchen was playing uh playing keyboards that guy was great he used a lot of hammond organ but a lot of spacey synthesizer sounds Jürgen Rosenthal was the was the drummer. And that guy was oh, a monster. Yeah. He was a, well, you know, man, amazing yeah. drummer. Amazing drummer, especially if you go back and you listen to that Eloy live, man, he's 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 insane. And it was him and Klaus Peter Matzo was the bass player. They they were just a great rhythm great section. Bass. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fra you know Frank was not a great singer. He you know kind of kind of sucked, but but you know you you got used to it. You know you kind of embraced it and and he. But I loved the way he played guitar. He had this fluidity to his solos, you know, which just just propelled you through the through through an album. Um, it just yeah, it's just you know, this is one of those bands that I'm very passionate about. And I was I was lucky I got to release their Visionary album for uh, for the U.S. And if it wasn't for uh, for an accident, Chad uh, would have had them uh, at Nearfest. They were, you know, yep. they were they were uh, yeah, they were. They were a, a bucket list band for me to see. There, you know, there were two bands that I didn't really get to see that I always wanted to, and and Eloy was one of them. So uh, we tried to make it happen, and just you know, we didn't get, we weren't fortunate. But it was, it was, yeah, just just a great band. I love everything they've done, except for except for Codename Wild Geese. I like everything, and 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 I think that Frank is still making good albums. I think the past the past few albums have been very very good. Irrigation too is phenomenal. That yeah, and he, he's and he's he just posted the other day he's he's working on the new album, so uh, it's gonna happen. I wish they'd lighten up on the narration on the last couple, but well, I would, I would but, agree. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I mean that that's my favorite Eloy right there. I mean, it's it's great, and like I said, you know, if if you would twist my arms at Ocean, okay, but like I said, I I think like the Ocean material, as strong as it is, I think it's even better on the live album. And they do almost the entire album on the live album. Yeah, he's being a planets too. Planets is a great album. Yeah, all those time to turn colors, yeah. right and, there, all and the lineup kept cool. changing, but there was a sound. There was an Eloy sound. We sounded like Eloy. Yep. No matter. Yeah, it's true. it's because of Frank. He was the glue, and you know he, he had a great control. Yeah, he owned the, he owned uh, the studio Horus. It's one of the top studios in Germany. So there was always good sounding albums. Love the band. Absolutely love the band. Good stuff. All right, Eric. Well, this next band, my number eight, is a band that really, um, the way it hit me was it created a love for the guitar in combination with violin. Got me going into the uh, dregs, Jean-Luc Pani. So, Pete, I'm going to do a little crossover with you. Mahavishu we'll Orchestra, Intermounting Flame. I've uh, been listening to this a lot, again, just because I've been getting into Fusion, and it's another one of those, it's a benchmark for me. Go back and listen to that. Um, but that guitar-violin combination, uh, I love it. And I whatever I can get it, I'll get it. So, um, like I said, the drags, Pony, this stuff, it's just incredible. And um, Sleepy time, brother. Great. Guitar yep. violin. I do have that somewhere, Lewis. Yeah. A little sleep is wrong somewhere. I can't find it. <laughs> One word. I'm Bugaton. <laughs> well, I'm actually going to make a, uh, a last minute change on my list. Uh oh. Yeah, because I realized that I left something off that I just can't leave out of my top 10. And it pains Hold your me. fire. What's that? Hold your fire. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It pains me to take this one out. And should I tell you which one is leaving? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. So I had it number seven. I had, show. I had Pink Floyd Animals at number seven. And I love wow. this album. It's going to have to drop down to number 11 because, you know, violin, two guitars, great keyboard player and singer. Kansas Left Overture from 1976 uh, yeah. is one of my most beloved albums. And I, as much as I love animals and I do, I like Kansas more than I like Pink Floyd. That just comes right down to it. And, mm -hmm. you know, so many great, what I love about Left Overture is like, you know, you got the, the big hit and carry on wayward son, which is still damn proggy. Right. You got all these like mini epics on there. You got some heavy stuff. You got some light stuff, just, 
Steve Walsh and, you know, the late Robbie Steinhardt on vocals. Just what a great combination. Man, Miracles Out of Nowhere, Magnum Opus, Questions of My Childhood, The Wall. I mean, it's just timeless music for me. It's such a perfect album. So uh, sorry, Pink Floyd, you're, you're at number 11, but I got to go with uh, Left Overture by Kansas as my number seven. Great album, Dave. Great album. Back to Chuck. You save it for when we do 11 through 15. <laughs> then I'll drop down. We'll be doing like this forever. We'll be like, oh, yeah. All right, yeah. 95 through 100. There you go. <laughs> That's true. Oh, man. My, well, my number, uh, number seven is um, Gentle Giants in a Glass House. Uh, nice. my, my all time favorite um, album from this band. Um, what did I know that they despised the album? I, I don't know why. You know, it means a lot to me more than it does to them. But um, I just think that this is just a band at their peak. You know, what so that it's um, just as quirky as anything that came beforehand, and just as just as wrong, just as tough as everything that came afterwards. Um, that's that one. I just love this album, man. The Runaway, uh, An Inmate's Lullaby, A Way of Life, Experience, A Reunion, and the and the title track. You know, uh, just an amazing album, man. What's up? Right here, man. That's, That's right. my number seven. In a glass house. But you are right. When I told Gary Green that was my favorite record, he gave me a dirty look. Yeah, jeez, man. <laughs> like, like you just you have to wonder if the reason they don't like the album is because the record label wouldn't release it in the states and they lost money out on the whole thing. Because I mean, how oh, could they not sucks, like that man. album? So good, so good. Amazing. I actually heard In a Glass House on XM the other day. I couldn't believe it. Really. <laughs> Yeah. Um, By the way, it's a great sounding album. Oh, it really is, man. It's, it's been a long time audiophile uh, album. Sort of the, the glass breaking. And, and yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. It's yeah, there's track. that oh, like release. WWA Records? Who released WWA. It? Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Black Sabbath was on WWA also. Yeah. Well, they toured with them. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of silly. Yeah, unfortunately. I would have loved that show. Are you kidding me? Hell yeah. <laughs> You'd have been the only one, I think. Outside of I, I, it don't matter. More room for me to spread out and have a good time. <laughs> You're a bunch of cunts. That's right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Off the old fuck. Right here. All right. Oh, man. All right, Chad, back to you. Well, I don't know if I want to follow that. That um, <laughs> Thanks for that. We, is there are there any, you have any commercials you can go to, Pete? You know, PSA something. Funny thing though right. is when I actually interviewed Derek Shulman on this channel, he actually told the whole story and he said it exactly as it came out that night. And I was like, "Whoa, I didn't expect to hear that." From you. Like, all right. He was like, "But that's exactly what it, you wanted the story. That's the story." I'm like, "All right, okay, that's great." Yeah, the uncut version. All right. So my number seven, um, I'm going to again be consistent. And I'm only going to move up two years. We're going to go to 1976. And uh, we are going to go with A Trick of the Tale from Genesis. Um, and the Genesis show, I picked that as my favorite album. Um, could have been The Lamb. Could have been Wind and Wuthering. Would never be uh, We Can't Dance, as we all know. Um, but it's so full of bass pedals and and amazing keyboards and 12 string guitars, especially like Entangled. Um, there's just a, so much power on the album, but it also has the, um, uh, the romanticism that they, that they skipped over with the lamb for the most part and they brought from Selling England as we, as we talked about, but like Squonk and Los Indos are just so powerful. Um, Dance of the Volcano is probably my favorite Genesis song. Um, there's Everybody Shines on this one. Pete, uh, Phil Collins, did such a great job filling in or replacing Peter Gabriel up front. Um, it's just it, a phenomenal album, start to finish. And if I'm on a desert island, um, I'm going to need my bass pedals. So that's coming with me. Very cool. Great album. All right, John. Hey, uh, well, my number seven album is Pink Floyd, Wish You Were Here. Uh, between sandwich between dark side and and animals and uh with the success of dark side um you know they could have you know put out dark side part two but that's not you know that's not what they did they kind of they have you know an awesome epic uh 
uh, the title, or not the title track, sorry, um, John on You Crazy Diamond, bookending the album. So they're kind of returning a little bit to the longer songs they did, you know, pre Dark Side. And I think, uh, you know, Richard Wright is is tremendous on this album, as as is Gilmore. I mean, on that song, it's it's an amazing song. Uh, there's really not much much else to be said about it. Um, and then they go into after that they go into Welcome to the Machine, which is you know their spacey side. I like the dark, you know, the dark tone of it. It's it's heavy, kind of almost pre-industrial, um, and it, and the themes that are running through the album, you know, like you know, it's all about loss, you know, loss of you know your soul or someone you love or you know, uh, it's just an amazing song. Some really nice guitar, acoustic guitar from Gilmer, but it's really Wright's, I think Wright uh, really comes to the fore on that one. Uh, have, a, have a Cigar, uh, Roy Harper on lead vocals is another great, just a good rock song, really catchy. Uh, and Gilmer and Wright shine on that one as well. And then you have Wish You Were Here, which is kind of funny. It reminds, it, it, it reminds me, I was in Australia on, a, on, a, on an island and you know there was this party on a beach and you know, you could hear the acoustic guitar. And of course it was, you know, Wish You Were Here. So we all kind of, this is such a classic song. Everyone knows the lyrics. Um, so it's one of those songs and albums that takes me back, right? It takes me back to a time in my life. Uh, and it just, it's just the, even though it's not the most happy music, but Floyd is my favorite band, bar none. So uh, I'm gonna go with, why don't you create, or, Shine on you. Wish you were here. Sorry, number seven. Great. Yeah, I was gonna say. I wish you were here. The title track is probably like the ultimate campfire song, and then you went and told yeah. that story. So there you have it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's, it's cool. Yeah. Excellent. All right, Stephen. And um, well, my number seven is a band that's already been covered in quite some detail. So I've gone for a different album from the one that Ken chose. I have gone for Eloy Ocean from nineteen seventy seven. And yeah, and as Ken said, it's a really close run thing. You could almost go from anything between kind of 73 and 81 with this band. There's, a, there's ups and downs along the way. Really, the standard is phenomenal. And they do have a signature sound. Yes, the influences are, it's clear where it comes from. But Eloy sound like Eloy. And realistically, I went with this one just because I, I love the way it ebbs and flows. I think it's so cohesive. I think it sounds fantastic. And I love the way that the keyboards sound on this album. I just think that they're astoundingly good, especially given the era that this album comes from. I've got it on vinyl as well as CD, and it sounds equally good on either. Um, I found it really difficult actually settling on one, and it really just comes down to which one do I play slightly more, and it's Ocean. So that's my number seven is Eloy Ocean. The cool. smart guy. <laughs> Makes a change, Ken, doesn't it? <laughs> and one of the great album covers of all time, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Fantastic yeah, album. Very cool. Yeah. All right, Lewis. Well, for me, um, and again, the understanding is, of course, that this 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 ranking is somewhat silly, right? Because what 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 is really the difference maker? I don't know, but um. Today, I'm going to go with another album that, even though I didn't pick it the last time, it is, it's it's their Who's Next in the catalog, and I just love it to death. I'm talking about moving pictures. Last time I went with Hemisphere, Hemisphere is a masterpiece, but today it's moving pictures, right? This is where they just became superstars, right? Yeah. And but the music, every song is indispensable, right? I mean, I can, I can, anybody plays that record and I want to hear the whole thing. It's not like I, I'm tired of any of the songs. So, no, mm -hmm. the camera eye, yeah, yeah that's that's so good. Mm -hmm. Funny and some of the stuff that hasn't been played a lot, really, right? I mean, Witch Hunt, Vital Signs, mm -hmm. that side B Great. that when when, when, he, when we were kids. I don't know about you, but you didn't really play side B that much. No. Side A was so kick-ass that you just wanted more of that. 
And then and then you suddenly discover that there's a side B and it's just as good. Right? This is bad. Yeah. This is bad. I have exactly that experience. So, I had the cassette and I would I would replay yeah. side one over and over. over and then I was on vacation with my parents and I had a you know walkman with me. And I just, I got done side one. I'm like, I don't want to waste my battery and re rewind it. So I'll listen to side two. And I was like, wow, this is just almost as good as side one. What have I been doing? Why am I not <laughs> listening to this? I think we all did that. Yep. Mm -hmm. George. All right. My number seven. Self-titled from Neural Code. This is a Brazilian trio. Uh, guitar player Kiko Loriera. He's in a power metal band at the time, Angra. He decides he wants to branch out and indulge a progressive side. So he does a guitar hero album that's like McAlpine meets Satriani. And then he does a Brazilian jazz album. It's totally different, playing all acoustic. Then he does this album, the Fusion Power Trio. Uh, the first call, Brazilian drummer, Cuco Teixeira. And the bass player, Tiago Santo, sounds like Jocko, for real. I mean like a more aggressive jacko a real go for the throw player um songs are all all beat stuff that brazilian feel um it's one of those weird albums where i've hardly been able to run into people that even know it much less convince someone to like it it's real real obscure but uh highly recommended brazilian power trio fusion eric have you heard that before that album has anybody <laughs> I've never heard it. I've never heard of it. Yeah, I got it from Feigenbaum. I don't know anybody else that carries it. I've never seen it. Reviewed. Feigenbaum never heard of it. Probably not. <laughs> 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 yeah. What do you guys do? What do you think? Um, let's see. Ferraro's got Rush, Permanent Waves. Nice. Cool. All right, Rick. Okay, um, so this will be the last one from the 21st century. The rest is goes up in the, only in the 20th century, and when Prague with King will probably be in my top five, right? But for this one, uh, this became a, a big wow factor for me because I love theater. I mean, when I before I became in the rock band, I had a tryout, you know, doing school plays and stuff like that. So I always liked theater, and so I've loved Tommy, I love Quantifinia, I love those kind of uh, rock operas when they're uh, done right and this one was done brilliantly it's a double album so if i'm gonna go on a desert island i'll just take a movie with me and uh, make sure i got something i haven't heard it to death so i didn't bring tommy or quadnifinia but i brought the neil morse band the similitude <clears throat> of a dream and it's a double album of just pure brilliant and, and maybe I'm still having the buzz from the Neil Moore show from Friday night. I just saw this last weekend. But I was thinking, man, I can't imagine not wanting to hear this album, a piece of this album, everywhere I go. I mean, it really sticks with me. And the band is just so top-notch. They're great performers. If you guys haven't checked it out, you got to do it. Uh, it's an amazing uh, experience. And it's just like any movie. It's an epic. You you have to watch it in it the way it's you know done first disc to the second disc, and uh, I I think it's a powerful album, and I just think it's one of the best thing uh, a band done in the twenty first century that that can stand up you know near the light of Candle to Tommy and Quadnifinia, and that says in a lot because I'm a big Who Who junkie, and even the Wall. I don't think the Wall has succeeded of some of the powerful stuff that they did here. Now, again, it's more of a band. It's not one guy show. It's not one, you know, here and there. This is a true band album and everybody sings their ass off. And that's what I love about this. I mean, Neil is a great singer, but he has great singers in his band and they really do amazing stuff and guitar playing, the keyboard, uh, you name it. Anything that you want to see in Prague that just, you know, makes you drop your jaw and wow, how will he, can they do this live? And they do. It's on this album. And so I feel really passionate about it because it's what I haven't had anything so, um, you know, just blew my mind. Usually I get a lot of bands that recycling stuff of the greatness of the past, but they did create something new, something different with their uh, personality. And I think Randy George, the bass player, said it best. It's uh, sort of like 
um, cinema rock because you're in a motion picture movie score, then it rock, then it's in an, you know another scene to another scene. It's so uh, big for a band, uh, six guys in a band. They just cover all the spectrum of music that it changes so dramatically that um, it is a really journey. And if that doesn't spell Prague, I don't know what will. And to do it in a concept album, that actually work. Unlike some of the bands you, you mentioned an album earlier tonight that didn't work when they try to do a double album theater, this one did work to me. And that's a really bold move to do because everybody's always going to compare to you to The Wall and The Quad Nymphenia and The Who and anything they've done in the past. And to me, that was pretty daring of this band, and I think they, they did it. Are we done? Awesome. Never heard Again. of it. My turn. Yep. So uh, my number seven, it's pretty conventional. Genesis selling by the pound. So here's a little twist if you guys never saw this. This is the Italian pressing. It came with a picture on the back and it came with Gayful with uh, the lyrics in Italian. Kind of just an oddball thing. <laughs> nice. Um, you know, we just did the Genesis uh, rundown recently. And while the lamb is amazing, and it's the outlier it's in the catalog for the gen for the gabriel era selling england is the most consistent album it's the most cohesive album uh you know whereas for me like something like supper's ready may be the ultimate peter gabriel genesis track uh, as an album selling england is, has is more focused and, than the lamb and it is just, I just, just everything about it is just, it's fantastic. I, I, you know, there's no reason really for me to elaborate too much on it. Two things you hear more Hackett and Mike Rutherford kills as a bass player on that album. Yeah, it's yeah. also, for, and also for, actually for the Gabriel era, it's probably the best sounding album of theirs. Oh man, yeah, and, great. Uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, it's. All the classic first, I mean, first or fifth. I mean, what else you have to say be, beyond that, you know? Neil Peart's uh, favorite Genesis album. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can hear it in Phil Collins' drumming. Yeah, so that's my number seven. Nice. Nice. Eric. Well, I know how it feels to be you, Pete, going last. Um, and <laughs> so I held this up before, and it is going guitar, violin. Left Overture. Um, I absolutely love it. Magnum Opus. I can still listen to Carry On Wayward Son, just like you said. Same here. Same here. Uh, that midsection of uh, Miracles Out of Nowhere, absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. Start to finish, um, not a bad moment. Great record. Um, and you said it all before. So Kansas Left Overture. I know. So Eric, what are you saying? You gladly give up the cleanup spot back to me next week? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, yes, I will. There you go. I, I, will See, take, I, I, will, never, I will retake my anchor role starting next week. You know, I never <laughs> mind going at the end because I pick such weird stuff. I never, I never worry about anybody else picking it. <laughs> Very true. All right. My number six and final pick for today uh, has already been mentioned. And another one of those bands where you could pick any number of their albums and i like a handful of their albums almost equally they all have merit to be coming with me to the desert island but i have to go to the one that i think just truly captivated me you know and turned me into a ridiculous rush fan even though i was already a fan and that was moving pictures you know that first side we know all those songs like the back of our hand right they're still great though. And that side too is all Killer. the stuff that we ignored back in the day. Yep. And now we're like, wow, that's just as good as the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah, I, when I go to listen to this album nowadays, I go right to camera, I witch hunt and vital signs. And yep. I think I used to hate vital signs back in the day. I'm like, Oh, what is this kind of like weird bouncy reggae type thing? Mm -hmm. I think vital signs is brilliant now. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I think about it, that, right. Mm -hmm. Just and such a great sounding album. And again, it's proggy, it's heavy, it's catchy. It's got everything we love about rush there's always part of me that wants to choose like hemispheres or permanent waves or you know farewell any of, oh yeah farewell the kings or any of the other albums i love them all to death but uh i 
this is to me is always going to be my go-to Rush album, even though I love all, a lot of the other ones almost equally. But yeah, so that's my that's my number six and final pick for today. And uh, do we do our last trip round, starting with Chuck? Mm -hmm. All right. My number six and final album for today is Jethro Tull's Benefit. Um, what's a while it doesn't get the the notoriety of anything that came after, you know, it, it Aqualung followed it up. Then it was a trick of a tale, a passion play. But um, in my opinion, this is perhaps um, the band at their finest hour, you know, and that's hard to say with all the great albums that came afterwards. But I just happen to have a sentimental feeling for the what's it for the 10 songs that are on this album, uh, which it just flows cohesively for me. And so and then the bonus tracks as well, um, The Witch's Promise, uh, Singing All Day, uh, Teacher, you know, uh, and Trying to Be. You know, this is just a, a, a great album. You know, what's it from start to finish? This is my number six and last um, album for the day. Jethro Tull's Benefit. Chuck, did you get the um, box release? No, no, I haven't got it yet. I haven't gotten it yet. But I'm that really kind of reinforced that album for me because um, I just hadn't listened to it in a long time. And, you know, you, you forget how great that really is. One of their most underrated mm -hmm. albums, I think it's another one of their bridge albums. It's like, mm -hmm. that's the album they had to do to move them into the Aqualung period and more of the mm -hmm. proggy mm -hmm. part of their career, I think. Really good album. Really good mm -hmm. album. It's I love Tom, always man. been one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah. Good my job. oldest brother, when he left home, that's, uh, and, and this was like, you know, back in 1976, I think. Uh, that was a one tall album in, in his collection that, that he had and i mean i didn't listen to it for a few years later but um yeah it's a great album yeah it is all right chad your final selection of the day well it's not gonna be jethro tall sorry to say <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it gonna be far out <laughs> no, I guess not. that's next week ken right. well i can um, see it. i can see it. no so for my number six and the last one for today I'm going to dip the toe into the fusion, uh, the fusion vault, and um, this one doesn't go quite as far as the Mahavish news and the and the Return to Forevers, as far as that classic, you know, top tier fusion. But it's one of my favorites. It's a little more rock than than those other albums, I would say, and it's Bill Bruford's second album, one of a kind. Um, I've always just loved the mix of sort of the. Uh, some of the rockiness with the, the jazz and fusion elements that came in. Um, it starts off with Hell's Bells with that, you know, that sort of pulsing dark synth uh, goes into a, a, you know, great kind of forward falling melody. And then you get introduced to Alan, Alan Holdsworth at, on this album, at least with uh, his solo, he just falls into it. And it's just like, it's bliss. Um, uh, one of a kind, great two, two part masterpiece. A lot of good Alan Holdsworth in that. You've got uh, Travels with Myself and 5G, really just shining with, uh, with uh, Jeff Berlin. Some of the stuff he does to start off 5G is just insane. I don't really understand it. Uh, and then you get a little bit of Jobson in there. You know, they played Sahara of Snow as a single track a couple times with UK. He has a co-writing uh, credit on part two. Uh, and, he, and he plays on Forever Until Sunday. Um, but yeah, this album, thankfully, they got rid of Ann Peacock. I couldn't take her on the first album. It feels good to me. It just it didn't sit well with me. Um, but uh, One of a Kind is, is an album I find myself going back to very often. I just think it's a phenomenal album, top to bottom. Again, like you guys said, if there's an album, if you don't skip any songs, it's in contention. That's my number six. Yep. And everyone Pitch always price. forgets about the great Dave Stewart, man. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Great great keyboardist. Yeah, he picked oh, some uh, great some great keyboard sounds on that album. So oh, good. I saw them at my father's place. That was the show that became the Bruford tapes. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, in Roslyn. And uh, it's funny, we went backstage after the show. <laughs> and Eddie and Eddie was backstage. Eddie, Eddie Jobson was backstage. And uh <laughs> and uh it was funny because Dave Stewart, he couldn't figure out how to open up a bottle top on a beer. So my friend grabbed it out of his hand and took it over and gave it a little very thankful. I thought you were going to say he opened it with his teeth or something. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and Bill, 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 is, Bill is the nicest guy. And he was yes. just, he was just kind of he holding really court is, yeah. and, 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 you know, of course, 
it's all drummers sitting in the audience and and they and people would, you know were trickling backstage and peppering him with questions and he was just unbelievably patient so he's good too but man that was they were a fucking great band that was yeah, that the, the drums was. sound so good on this album too yeah that was a wlir bro- radio broadcast the Bruford tapes so yeah that's right yeah it, it was great definitely show. one of a kind album yeah and bill's got a new youtube channel he's yeah. putting up lots of clips yeah. and little interviews snippets and things they tend to be quite short it's really very good stuff i thoroughly enjoyed it so far all right, John, your final pick of the day. Uh, my final pick of the day. Well, I was thinking about doing a change up. Um, <laughs> See what I started there? <laughs> well, I was going to go with Pink Floyd, The Wall, and I'm kind of stacking up the Floyd here. Um, but then, you know, I think I might go with Steely Dan, Asia. Uh, and it's cool. another one of those albums that, I mean, I remember. And I did buy this in nine. I think it was released in '77. That's, and I remember going on, on the on the bus, and uh, there was a store, Records on Wheels in Saskatoon, um, and, and the guy. I mean, he he knew his stuff. The owner, Ron Missouri. He he. I mean, he was an encyclopedia. Uh, but anyway, that was. I think it was a Saturday special, ninety nine cents for the vinyl. Uh, they had a ninety nine cents Saturday. I think maybe before noon or something. It might've been all day, but they'd sell out pretty quickly. But that was after my brother and I heard Peg uh, on the radio. And I, I'll never forget, they did this uh, kind of band war or song war between Sweet Love is Like Oxygen and uh, or, um, Sealy Down Peg. And uh, my brother, I mean, we're all, we were both Sweet fans, but uh, we've never really heard of Steely Down. And I, but I, that, that might have been the first time I've heard that song. And I remember I voted for Steely Dan, Peg, and my brother was really pissed off with me because I mean, how could you not vote for Love is Like Oxygen? I mean, it's sweet, man. Because, you know, Ballroom Blitz, I mean, I mean, everyone had Desolation Boulevard and everything else, but uh, it's kind of a sentimental pick. And, but the playing is, is amazing on this album. And it's, the flow is so beautiful. And I don't, I don't know if it's my, you know, favorite. I mean, it's hard to hard to say. I mean, uh, with Steely Dan, because I'll go from Katie Lie to Pretzel Logic to um, Asia to, you know, whatever. And it, it, it changes, you know, depending on, depending on, you know, the day of the month. But um, I just love this album. So we'll go with Steely Dan, Asia. The, t- the, tri- the title track, Mary <laughs> Carlton. Um, Wayne Shorter and Steve Gadd. Yeah. Such a beautiful song. I, mm-hmm. I, and it kind of, it opened my door to, you know, to jazz, actually. And even though I didn't kind of get into jazz much later on, um, but that's where you could, you know, the combination of jazz and rock, um, it kind of, it, I'd never really heard anything like it at the time. So, one of the album. greatest sounding albums of all time, I think. It yeah. is. It's amazing, actually. Yeah. I, I that's another band that I constantly change in and discuss. Well, my favorite Steely Dan album of this week is The Royal Scam, and then the next week it'll be Asia, and the next week it'll yeah. be Debut. It's just like they're all too. so they're good. So good. Yeah. They're all I only so have good. one favorite from that band. It's the second album, mm-hmm. Count Out to Ecstasy. Mm-hmm. They're all good. They are great. Yeah. yeah, cool. They all have great players. Oh, for me, well, they do. this is an unpopular opinion, I know, but for me, um, it, somehow, if somebody had the idea that they wanted to make an art movie that was also a porno, Steely Dan would be the soundtrack. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, the name that's, lends itself. That, that, that's kind of the thing, and, and I, I just can't <laughs> shake that feeling. So it, it's just, um, you know, I, I can't get past it. I don't know why. Has <laughs> anyone seen the, sorry, the classic vinyl album series yeah they, that was pretty yeah. good and i mean i the way they you know they get some blues guy or jazz guy and you know come in and it was very you know orchestrated right you oh, here's your part do it but i mean donald fagan had all this stuff written down you know he knew exactly you know which player to use and you know and to, oh, yeah, to yeah, make yeah. that album flow amazing it's just amazing how consummate how, professionals yeah. 
Yeah. You, you won't Nothing find Nothing but bad respect. This yep. is a, I, I freely admit it's a me problem, but mm -hmm. I just can't shake that that vibe from my head. I don't know why. Yeah, it would be cool, though, to get the outtakes, because I think on a lot of those tracks, they would talk about how they had two different drummers play and then three or four different guitar players, and then right. they picked one. But can you imagine getting a something where you're hearing Jay Graydon on one and then you hear whatever Larry Carlton on another just to hear their take on that song? Lit Randall. Kind of cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, I had friends over here about a week ago and we got talking about music. And we're saying, all right, name a band you hate. And we went around the horn and he, without any hesitation, said Steely Dan. Wow. I don't get it. It's soulless. <laughs> I mean, who's going off? Like, for everyone. Oh, okay, all right. I get it. <laughs> I, don't, I, do, I, I do not Let's hate it. About something else. I, I do not hate Steely Dan, but they, I, I just have this. My, my wires got crossed somewhere along the way and they're still <laughs> shorting out whenever I hear them. I, can, I hated them in, in college and then something clicked later on and now I like them a lot. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they're, they're a band that some people just, most, well, most people that I know feel very passionate about or they just don't get it, right? And I, I noticed like a lot of younger people don't really get Steely Dan for whatever reason. I would say that their first um, three albums, especially um, Katie Light and A Countdown to Ecstasy, is, um, would be albums that that um, what to any youngsters would probably like from them because they don't sound anything like anything that came afterwards. Yeah, they're you know, a little more rocking, right? It's mm -hmm. a little more conventional, I guess. The first two, especially, especially their first two. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love. Yeah, them. I can't buy it through. Well, yeah, for sure. I love. Them. All right, where were we, Stephen? Yeah, so if, if Chad is keeping a list of all the, the usual suspects that people are going to raise, I've got a funny feeling that I'm going to tick one of those off his list for him with my next choice. Um, we're going <laughs> a little bit more recent, and I could have chosen a number of any from Stephen Wilson's catalogue. So I went for the future. No, 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 I didn't. I, didn't. I went for... <laughs> Uh, the Raven that refused to sing, uh, and of course, uh, other stories. Um, mm -hmm. I just think this is fantastic. I it's think as far album. as modern progressive rock goes, we're right up here now, 2013. I mean, there's royalty on this album in terms of the modern prog scene. Wilson himself, Guthrie Govan, Nick Beggs, there's Holzman, Miniman, Travis. Everything on this album is fantastic. Yep. I absolutely adore it. You've got many epics, you've got shorter songs. By that, I mean seven minutes. And it's just phenomenal. It's crafted, it's cared about, it's melancholy, but it draws you in, it tells stories. Fantastic. I, I couldn't live without it. And I don't skip a single second of it. Yes. So, yeah. Stephen Wilson right. had to go in here. In my opinion, that's his best yeah. record he ever yeah. made. I I agree. Agree. Exactly. Certainly his last great one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There are other things in the catalogue that are fantastically good. Not all solo, but this, to me, will be up there with his best come the end, I think. Yeah. Hey, Stephen, is that the art book edition? This is... The deluxe one? Plastic. Yeah, you better treat that carefully. I just sold one of those for $300. The, oh, nice. wow. <laughs> 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 I'll put this down over here now. <laughs> Don't sure. spill it's, beer on it is what the man is trying to I, tell you. <laughs> Steven's, Steven's like doing lines of coke off it, but uh, <laughs> we uh, well, I saw and I can have some French fries. Pick up that album. Yeah, I, I sold one on. I just sold one on Discogs for for a little over three hundred. Wow. Okay. Wish I had two. Yeah, I was well, going to say now I, all the you wish you had two. They're like, ooh, I, I'm going to go sell mine. You wish you had two. I I was selling these things. I had stacks of them. <laughs> Wow. And I, yeah. I, I found one that I had set aside and I forgot about it. And then we looked it up on Discogs. And I'm like, oh, screw it. I'll, I'll stick with the CD. I'll stick with the album. I can sell this. <laughs> well, Ken, that's what you got to start doing now. Take like a handful of all these things that you're going to be worth money at some point, even if no. you don't know yet, just set them aside for a year or so. No, Pete, absolutely. All those Jethro Tulls that, that you guys are spooging over, right? <laughs> I mean, I used to. I have stacks of them now, like Benefit. I just got a restock of Benefit. I'm putting one aside. Yeah, All I these see. deluxe editions, they're going for crazy money. The Genesis box, uh, those Genesis boxes. And I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm killing myself because I had, yeah, 
the green box. What did I, I forgot what I got like four hundred dollars for it or something. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's 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 in, insane. And you know, it was regular inventory. All this stuff. I see what the price is going for. I'm like, we had stacks of them, <laughs> and I, I just didn't save them. That UK box logo is probably the most expensive thing I have as far as a, as far as resale. Oh. I can't tell you how many so of those limited. I saw. It was so limited. Hmm. I can't tell you how those UK boxes. There was that yes box that uh, crazy. Yeah, crazy what that stuff's going for now. All right, Lewis, your last Okay. Page. So um, if I really wasn't a desert island, I would I would have to pick this particular live album because it has some of the best material from their whole career. And it's from a show that I attended with my daughter when she was 12. And I'm talking about King Crimson live in Chicago. That's great. Yeah. Cool. This, this, but, but live album is not allowed. Right. So instead, yeah, you pick whatever you want, you pick whatever you want. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm going with this. <laughs> my other choice was, was, was discipline. Right. Oh, because whoa, this whoa, is, whoa, uh, whoa. That, whoa, ho yeah. hold on. That's three of you now that ha have had an elephant's choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, this this record is absolutely amazing. Can you and read? I, the I, I, I still don't really. It's hard for me to believe that I was actually there. You know. Yeah, Lewis, read you the know, track. Lewis, read the track list on that. Yeah, read it. So here's a track list. It, it starts with uh, Bellscape and Orchestral Warning, then Lark's Tongues Part One. Neurotica, The Errors, Circus, The Lizard Suite, Fallen Angel, Larks Part Two, Islands, Picture of a City. That's the first disc. The second one has Indiscipline, which with the three drums is ridiculous, right? Then the construction of light, including a, a rare but totally epic Tony Levin train wreck, and they left it, which I really appreciate it. Um, then there's Easy Money, The Letters, Interlude, Meltdown, Radical Action 1, Level 5, which is a kick-ass tune, Starless, and then the encore was Heroes and the 21st Century Schizoid Men where the, the, the Gavin Harrison drum solo is a master class on how to play melodies and full limb independence. So yeah, this, this record, man, come on, right? Cool. I have to go with this. Yeah, it's a great Perp, one. Man. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they've they've released so many great live albums over the last five years. Yeah, yeah, well, that's the thing. That's but wonderful. but for me, that's special because I get a little chunks of all of my favorites of Crimson. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. played by possibly the tightest live unit. Right, I do miss Bruford, but yeah, I miss Baloo, which is why this was my backup. Right, because this has no. Everything is essential, right? Yep. Yep. But yeah. Cool. Kate Crimson, nice. live in Chicago from 2017. Very yes. cool. Love it. And my daughter got it. That was the thing that made me the happiest of the night. She got the, she really got it. What's the secret, Lewis? Because I need that. <laughs> no, no, there is, there's not thanks to me. That's all her. I, I, I couldn't I'm working hard, but it's not it. working. She, she <laughs> just went and dug it. That's cool. You know, her favorite band is is fucking Tenacious D, right? Has nothing to do with, uh, but but she went to see King Crimson and she she loved it. You know, yeah, I would say I, I don't know though. too many women or girls who like King Crimson. In fact, when I go to a King Crimson concert and I see a female in the audience, I'm kind of like, what? Do you, you work doing? here? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> are you, did you lose a band? <laughs> How much your husband or boyfriend? Think? Blink, Blink if you need help. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh no, no. Julia loved it. She she was really listening very That's intently. Great. So I was that I was really awesome. really happy to see that. You know, very cool. But even happier I was when she was a, a little baby and then she would start singing a, a Master Exploder full lyric version because you can't tell a baby not to cuss, right? <laughs> so she's sitting there in her stroller and she's singing. You know, my voice is fucking powerful. Wow. Like, like, and it, so that is that was awesome also so. yeah that's very cool it, it's funny I, I i had my parents come over yesterday to i had uh 
I had DVR the uh, my appearance on the uh, White Snake documentary that was on Reels yeah. TV the other night because my mom's like, oh, my mom and dad are like, oh, we want to see you on TV, your TV debut, right? So they came over and my dad is kind of like nodding off and my mother's trying to pay attention to it. <laughs> Throughout the whole thing, she's looking at it, like shaking her head. But then when I'm on screen, she goes, oh, there you are, there you are. I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> and at the end, I'm like, well, what did you think? She goes, oh, it was great when you were on, but I really don't like that music. And I'm thinking, wow, well, there, we there, there we go. There we go. I'm not even going to tell her about it because she'll be kind of like, "What is this?" Noise? Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah. Hey, Peter, I watched. I watched the whole thing. Cool. Cool. I, I watched the little excerpt that somebody posted. Yeah. Oh, so the first time I see you wearing a shirt, like an actual shirt. Well, here's the thing. I actually brought that as a backup because I was wearing a white snake t-shirt. I thought I was looking cool and everything. And I walk in, and then the the director guy who I was on Zoom with, he's looking at me. He goes. I'm not sure we can let you wear that shirt and i'm like really Why? it's like well it might be kind of like a rights thing i'm like but it's a white snake documentary i bought it from the band and i'm like yeah let, let me go check with our legal person hold on they had to blur it out God. or something no i, I had it i had the, the button down shirt in my bag so i'm like all right i'll just they're like yeah we don't think you can wear it i'm like jesus it's a white snake shirt bought by the band bought from the band it's like all right so i put the other shirt on a boat it's, it's like all right where, where were you in manhattan yeah it was in manhattan i forget the club it was some old rock club that has been there for a million years i forget the name of it so that's crazy yeah it was really weird because they uh you know they told me specifically when they were giving me directions and time to show up and all that they're like make sure you show up at your scheduled time and don't come early and i was like all right cool so I get there actually 20 minutes early and I'm wandering around the block. I went and had a slice of pizza. I'm just kind of like looking like, all right, all right, it's three minutes before my scheduled time. So I call the guy, he comes up, he unlocks the door, lets me in. I walk in, he goes, ah, too bad you didn't come 10 minutes ago. Joe Bonamassa was here. And I'm like, you big dummy. Oh, man. Yeah. Nope. yeah, I'm going to jump back. I'm going to make my number 11 pick now. And that is slide it in. <laughs> Great album. Yeah. Great album. <laughs> it is. Not prime, but a great album. One, don't, don't play that one for your mom, Pete. Yeah. No, right she, to didn't the like, top. <laughs> she didn't like any of the songs from that. No, even the bluesy stuff. She was like, yeah, it's too much screaming. Like, screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, George, your final pick of the day. Uh, my number six is from Spain, 1977. Iceberg, Sentiments. Oh. Um. A quartet heavily on the Latin end, uh, like the Latin end of the RTF kind of style, a little bit of uh, Mahavishnu, uh, the guitar player and the keyboard player, a lot of trading on this album. I had one beat, the guitar tone's a little screechy on the leads, but uh, other than that, just balls out Latin fusion. Uh, the keyboard player's Right up there for me with with Chick and Jan Hammer as a Moog player. His solos are just incredible. Uh, Josep Moss, um, one of five albums, but for me this one was uh, a, a cut above the rest of them. So Iceberg Sentiments. Great pick. You just named five I albums. Think. I've heard of two of them. <laughs> that's, that's that's why I love them because you learn. Oh, it's awesome. Iceberg, Iceberg was a great band. Oh yeah. yeah. The, the last album got a little, maybe a little too jazzy. It's a little, moved a little too far away from jazz rock, like what they were doing on Sentiments and yeah. uh, Food Uncommon. But, uh, but yeah, that was a class band. Well, yeah, all their albums were worth hearing, though. That's, I like them all. And what was strange is they kind of morphed into Pegasus, and Pegasus wasn't nearly as good. Nope. You know, Max Sune's solo albums are great. The guitar player. Yeah. I mean, they're like, they're like the best albums that Al Demiola never recorded. <laughs> I mean, they really are. They're, they're amazing. So in the sixth slot, Mr. Ferraro has King Crimson Red. Wow, I got, I've got zero on him so far. <laughs> Good choices. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, that, amazed, I'm amazed he chose five. red i'm really surprised he chose red over like discipline or b i know how much he loves blue i'm surprised well it didn't wait did you, you say he, he said he just picked red right yeah he, red. he was trying to tell me is providence even a song well you picked the album my friend <laughs> go put on your yellow sweatshirt <laughs> maybe maybe it's time we realize that he's just a a, a yoda level troll 
Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And he just, he, he's just like, this is a persona he's having fun with. But Yoda wore a sweatshirt too, didn't he? <laughs> well, he had a hooded, he had a hooded thing. Right. Yeah. 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 Jedi a hooded. Of a sweat jacket. You don't want to wear the sweatshirt when he's in disguise. Yeah. <laughs> Secretly, Anthony's favorite bands are like Henry Cow and uh, you know, Magma. Clap Happy, yep. Slayer. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna get them to think that all I care about is uh, Steve Hackett and Eddie Jones. The fluffiest like, prog ever made is gonna be my cover story. <laughs> John Anderson. <laughs> oh, Anthony, we love you. We love you, Anthony. Oh yeah. We'll see. We'll see him next week. So, uh, Rick. What do you got? Okay, well, um, this is uh, another concept album, and uh, it's already been mentioned by my buddy, uh, Lewis and Pete. Um, what I like about this album is uh, the way it opens up with uh, a doctor trying to put the person in hypnotic spell. We're talking about scenes from a memory, and then just the, you know, just the, that part of it alone was pretty creative, and then to take them out of it at the end of the uh, album uh, was kind of cool. But wow, what a powerful music that is. Um, the Overture is still my favorite thing. They put everything in it in the front of it. But every song tells a story and they do it really well. And uh, to wait to the very end, as uh, the spirit carries on, you just feel like you're holding that banner at the very end of the song. You know you know the album coming to a close. You can almost picture the curtain falling and then the doctor comes back and pull him out of that <laughs> hypnotic state. It's a creative album. Not only audibly to listen to it, but you see him put that, do that live, uh, which uh, I know Pete did, and I've got the DVDs uh, for that. Uh, but it, great concept album, one of the best, um, you know, um, of the last of the 20th century. It was 1999. So, um, so anyway, that's my uh, number six pick, and uh, just like my buddies here, it's a, it was a game changer for me too. Yeah, and as great as it is on the album or the CD, uh, live. I've seen them play it live a couple times. Man. Yeah, the live version just destroys the album. Oh, it's yep. so good. It's yeah. just, you know, you're watching, you're like, God, how are they pulling this off? Exactly. Like, without a hitch, right? It's just crazy. Right. It's crazy. Amazing. It's all pre recorded. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ken, what do you got? My number six, very conventional album. Yes, Relayer. Yeah, excellent. Good choice. So, I mean, uh, Patrick Moraz joins. Van, Van, Van Gellis had tried out when Wakeman left, and uh, he, I think he turned them down. And uh, you can imagine if Van Gellis was in the band, I don't think it would have been radically oh, different from, from when Wakeman was in the band. But Moraz was a totally different player. He was like the X factor. So, uh, Supposedly, Patrick had this jazz background, but I've never, frankly, I've never seen any proof of it. But he does sort of bring that element to the band. Um, it's easily the heaviest album. This is sort of like, you know, kind of like Yes's metal album in a way. Uh, and, and that's the album I play for guys who, for like guys who are into metal and they want to get a taste of prog. I play them Relayer. Uh, the, uh, Gates of Delirium. I mean, it's just it's just a fantastic album, and like I said, Patrick's playing is is insane. I mean, he's uh, they're they're all all of the. It's a shitty recording, by the way, but um, uh, all of them are just at the top top of their game. And it was funny. You know, Eddie Offord was such a great engineer, and what he did with ELP sounded so much better than what he did with Yes, but. Um, yeah, I, this is, it's also, again, sort of like from the classic period, this is sort of like the outlier, I guess. And and it's really because of Mraz. I mean, once Wakeman was rejoined, they kind of reverted back to their, to the old sound. Yep. So yep. he was, he was the game changer. That's my number six. Who here would have liked to have heard another album with that lineup? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, as much as I love going for the one, I would have loved to have heard another from these guys you could and you know like i was saying earlier i mean you could hear like that romantic war you know return to forever element that was in there um his his soloing style was was very different his his tonality was very different he just brought a different element to the band and they just assimilated it it worked I and mean, all those guys were up for it yep 
I love how on that album. Hmm? What, what? I love how on that album. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're all great. How, all of them. Because well, there sometimes how just pisses me off, man. But on that <laughs> album, man, his sound, he <laughs> really sounded well, pretty good on that album. <laughs> Damn it, Steve. How <laughs> only pisses me off when he sings. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. True. Have you, um, did you guys ever hear Yes with that lineup play the old stuff? Like, how did Patrick Morass handle the, the old songs? It changed it, but it was still good. I mean, mm-hmm. listen to yeah, yes. I would imagine it might be interesting it's to hear yes those shows, verses right? too. Listen to yeah, Yes, yeah, listen yes to yes shows. shows. Yes shows. Yeah, Yes shows. Mm-hmm. I'm going to look for that. Oh, he handled it, but, but he, was, he was a very different player than, than, than Wakeman. Not as flashy, but just but still there, uh, just as great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He played all the surface parts, all the stuff what, that you want to hear, and then any improvisation he took on his own. But it was more melodic than being a showboat. That's for sure. I mean, he. I mean, he's no Jeff Downs, right? So, <laughs> hey, I like that. Sorry. <laughs> Man, that was cru- that was cruel. I'm sorry. That was tough. <laughs> Eric, what do you got? Well, I'll end on the same note Ken did, but I'm going to go with Close to the Edge. So I'll go with the classic lineup that had Wakeman. Uh, again, just three songs. And even the softy, George is a great one, right? And you and I is fantastic. Uh, Siberian Catru and the title track. I mean, it just, to me, that's classic, yes. As much as I like Relayer and Drama, that is the classic, yes, record for me, Close to the Edge. Right. And, and- Eric's gonna have five albums better than that. I can't. I can't wait for next week. <laughs> can't come soon enough. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay. uh, I was gonna say more on that later, but later is gonna yeah. be. You have yeah. To wait later. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm sitting here looking for my final pick, and I'm like, gee, I went first today, so I don't have. A- <laughs> <laughs> Autopilot. Yeah. I hope everybody enjoyed me going first today. Uh, Kind of threw me off my game a little bit, but that's okay. Um, yeah, what was I going to say? I don't know. Anyway, we still managed to keep Stephen Reed up till four o'clock in the morning. So you know, <laughs> he's going to be like, "All right, so you're a fucking legend." Like he's going to get it many times. I'm just waiting to start working a minute. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Uh, so thanks for watching everybody uh feel free to join us in this little escapade we're doing uh figure out what your top 10 favorite prog fusion prog metal albums of all time are are your are do you have i can't speak man i've been doing this too long case of the yeah. old yeah whatever it is and uh <laughs> pick your six through ten put them in the comments below join in on the fun and then stay tuned next week where we will go five to one one to five no one here gets out alive. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little delirious. So anyway, <laughs> this is on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn all the time. Day, Uber time. Central today here on CA Tranquility in the Prague seat. So thanks for watching, everybody. Stay tuned for part two next Tuesday night. For Chuck Alvarez, Chad Hutchinson, John Newdorf, Stephen Reed, Louis Nasser, George Lemay, Rick Labonte, Ken Golden, Eric Porter, did I miss anybody? And Anthony Ferraro, who didn't make it today, but he will be here next week. Uh, I am P. Parlo. Thanks for watching, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and uh, we'll see you real soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Night. Good night, everybody. everybody.